they still do feel devastated. Another young guy who didn't have to come back, who could have survived, decided to come back. It's hard to take. The men who've been in the van of this army throughout the campaign are the second paras. They were the first, again, into Port Stanley, and the first to march through the streets to hold a thanksgiving service in the island's tiny cathedral. On the 14th of June, the second paras marched into Stanley. The conflict was over. But for some of these soldiers, their psychological battle was just beginning. We have all experienced events in the last four weeks that have probably changed our lives considerably. When you hear the whistle of something coming in, you're not sure what it is, but you know it's nasty. <laughs> or you've got a bit of cover and you know that you're going to have to get up and move and there's somebody trying to kill you. When you're faced with these stark realities, I think you would be a very insensible person if you didn't think more profoundly than perhaps you ever have in your life before. When we were uh, doing the prisoner handle in Port Stanley, um, we used to round the, the Argentinian prisoners up and, and line them up, um, ready to put them on the, uh, the boats to, to go back to Argentina. They weren't allowed to take anything back onto the ships apart from the clothes they stood in. So anything, any items that they had were confiscated. Um, some of the guys were getting bayonets and berries and all sorts of paraphernalia, compasses and oh, lots and lots of different sorts of stuff. But um, I spotted this chap holding a, a black box and I was quite intrigued by this. So I went over and called him out and opened up the, the box and to my surprise there was a trumpet. And I thought that would be a really unusual sort of war trophy because, you know, I thought there couldn't be that many trumpet players on the island. Could this war trophy hold the key in laying his painful war memories to rest? In Scotland today, there are nearly half a million war veterans many have made an easy transition from military to civilian life. But a significant minority suffer from mental health problems as a result of their military service. When people come back from the situation, the war situation, um, it's sometimes uh, moderate to severe depressive symptoms they can have, or more commonly it's um, abusing alcohol or other substances. Um, to help them sleep because they may have nightmares about particular situations. But for many people, these symptoms lessen as time goes on. Uh, it's for a, a small minority of people that it really does cause lasting damage. Stuart Colquhoun was 21 when he joined the 1st Battalion Royal Scots Regiment, serving in the First Gulf War. On leaving the army, he struggled to cope in Civvy Street, which resulted in him trying to take his own life. Didn't have the finances to go back to, to Edinburgh. I was still upset about situations from my previous marriage and it just seemed that that was the best way for everybody. It was just to end it all. But I think the thing that has to be realised by the powers that be is that the British Army is great at breaking you down and building you up to fit the purpose of being a soldier on the ground. But they neglect to, if you like, for once of a better term, deprogram you, ready to face the trials and tribulations that you would face back into the civilian population. 
the Ministry of Defense is increasingly recognizing the effects of mental trauma and its prevalence across the armed forces. Naval veteran David Cruikshank served as a junior marine electrical engineer in the Falklands conflict. He was consistently exposed to highly pressurized situations for a sustained length of time. Basically, I was just sitting there waiting for something to happen. And if something did happen, that's the only time I actually would have, you know, been able to do anything about it. You know, but up until then, I was basically sitting in a room, a tiny room with another guy, um, waiting for a bomb to drop, which thankfully didn't. People, when they go to the movies and they see a film, they're in a state of, if they go and see a thriller, they're in a state of tension for about 90 minutes, and then they come out and they go, wow. Wow, that was great, and they talk about it, and the tension relaxes. But if you imagine doing that every day for maybe up to two, three weeks, you do that, you're in that state of heightened tension, it's got to have some sort of effect on you. David was only 21 when his naval career was cut short. I had an injury to my knee. Um, which never got any better. So I was being medically discharged from something I had wanted to join all my life. I was depressed, to be honest. Um, there's, no, there's no putting any gloss on it. I was physically unfit and mentally unfit, and then that was me and Civvy Street having to deal with it. Like David, Tony also struggled in becoming a civilian again. I never spoke about the Falklands for years. I just never felt that I could talk to anybody about it. Um, and it's always this thing of, you know, they don't understand, civilians don't understand what it's like. Um, but you took it out in other ways. I was a very angry young man, you would, you'd drink too much, you'd get involved in fights. And that was common, not just with me, that was common with a lot of the guys at that time. And found it really hard to adjust to being back into normal life, if you like. Since his war experience, Tony Banks has gone on to unprecedented success. An outstanding businessman, he sits at the helm of a multi-million pound empire and now dedicates his time and money in helping the charity Combat Stress. Combat Stress specializes in looking after veterans with a wide range of mental health issues, including those suffering from the condition post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. People that come to us present um, 14 years after their discharge from the armed forces, uh, around about the same sort of age as yourself, um, but uh, certainly in most cases have not successfully made the transition between service life and civilian life. 75% uh, for example of the people that we currently treat are unemployed um, and sometimes have been, in most cases in fact, have been long term unemployed. Um, they suffer with ill health, physical ill health often, as well as mental ill health. So, so there are stark differences. Post-traumatic syndrome is a psychological reaction following intense traumatic events, particularly those that threaten life. For these veterans, Hollybush House is a safe haven. At this facility, they receive psychotherapy and share their experiences through group-based activities. I came here, talked to the guys, stuff like, well, you'd remember holding a rifle, going out on a patrol, you get that wee buzz. If I tried to say that to my psychiatrist at Civic Street, he, would, he never understood, and I felt as if I was banging my head against the wall. But, I mean, nobody understood, it was just me, until I came here. He must have come across yourself, you must have had battles within yourself. Absolutely. You that's one of the reasons I'm sitting here, and that's one of the reasons I'm getting involved, I'm involved yeah. in combat stress, because ultimately it's that internal battle that you're going through yeah. all the time. And the thing is, that if, you know, a physical injury, as bad as it is, someone's got a broken miss, a leg missing or that, you can see it. Yeah, but, see. but what's going on in your head? Peter can't see yeah, it. I've always said that I'd rather have. I've rather had my leg black, yeah. because I can see it. Mm -hmm. But because it's inside my head, people... When, they, when you start getting angry and you start going off on one, people think, uh, when they say to you, oh, pull your socks off, sort yourself out, you, you don't understand what, what it's like 
you know, when it starts getting the, the wee dark hours of the morning and you start fighting not to go to sleep.